This is a nuclear fuser I built a couple of months ago. It's cute, but directly behind me is only a test section of the Polaris nuclear fusion generator at Helion Energy. Just a little bit bigger. As their seventh prototype, Polaris is a next-gen fusion generator unlike anything you've ever seen. With over 100,000 parts all built to ridiculous precision and scale, it sits in a 150,000 square foot facility that gives you chills. A few weeks ago, Helion invited me for a tour to pick the brain of their passionate CEO, talk to the project lead bringing this generator into reality, and to nervously watch with them as they powered up their Polaris formation for one of the first times. So let's take a peek into what Helion's been brewing up. Fusion is cutting edge tech, and so is the event that Keysight Technologies is throwing on September 12th. Keysight live from the lab. It's a free live stream for engineers and techies such as yourself, and will take you inside electric vehicle test labs to explore the tech behind high power charging, batteries, and how EVs might actually fuel the grid. And let's be honest, battery tech, AKA energy density tech, kind of the new frontier. You'll also have a chance to win a six gigahertz, eight channel oscilloscope and other pro-grade test gear. They do these events several times per year and past events are recorded on their site. If you sign up using my link in the description, Keysight will give you an extra bonus entry into the giveaway. Let's talk fusion. Situated just north of Seattle, Washington, Helion Energy's Antares test facility is ground zero for the future of energy production. Inside this building is a passionate team of over 150 visionaries, mechanics, and engineers who know that nuclear fusion power is inevitable, and they're poised to make it a reality. This is Iron Man's basement. There's no other way to explain it. <laughs> fusion may be the most important technological pursuit in the history of our species, but <laughs> it really isn't easy. You see, it requires temperatures in the hundreds of millions of degrees Celsius and also pressure similar to the center of the sun in order to force atoms together against their will. And when those atoms fuse, tremendous amounts of energy are released. But it's about as easy as getting an tegza to eat a tomato. Tomatoes are disgusting. Achieving successful fusion with positive power out is the fight of our century. And make no mistake, innovators around the world are coming up with creative designs to accomplish this. For example, Lawrence Livermore National Labs uses a method called inertial confinement, which relies on arrays of super powerful lasers to superheat a pellet of fuel to the point of fusion. They recently made headlines with this. General Fusion is going about it in a mechanical approach, relying on moving pistons to compress the fuel and a liquid metal wall that resists corrosion from ignition. It's pretty interesting. Then we've got the Joint European Taurus, or JET, which relies on magnetic confinement of plasma and is a tokamak small enough to fit into a room. And of course, we can't leave out the Multination Eater, which is a Goliath tokamak several stories tall and the largest international science collaboration in history. The tokamak approach involves a toroidal vacuum which contains a ring of plasma bound into place with ultra-strong superconducting magnets. While this method creates conditions needed for fusion, startup costs are biblical and they're prone to plasma instabilities which damage reactor walls, meaning continuous repair is inevitable. While we've made massive strides in this topography, we've got a ways to go. Maintaining about 10 times the temperature of the sun only a meter away from a metal wall has its problems. Shocker. Spearheaded by their CEO, David Kirtley, Helion's approach is so different, they've attracted numerous investors excited to support their development. And after they walked me through their Antares test facility, I could understand why. The topography they've chosen for not only producing a fusion event, but also capturing the produced energy is brilliant. Helion's Polaris generator uses what's called a field reverse configuration plasma, or FRC, which essentially allows for extremely high temperatures in a very compact space. It's also a type of plasma that contains itself. So they take two FRCs, slam them together, and force them to initiate fusion. And there's a lot to be excited about this type of topography, but I think I'll let their CEO, David, spill the beans. We were both equally excited to talk fusion. Walk me through a little bit about the approach that you guys are using for nuclear fusion, because I understand what you're doing is a little bit different. Yeah, so we use an approach called pulsed magnetic fusion. Our approach is a bit different, where we take a high temperature plasma confined by magnets, and then rather than trying to hold on to it forever, we squeeze it. We squeeze it, increasing pressure and temperature, until fusion happens, and then the most important part, we then expand it, extracting all that electrical energy that we put in back out to the system. Um, allowing us to build these systems really efficient and then in theory a lot smaller and cheaper than anybody else. 
Relying on a sustained plasma like the classic tokamak design has its advantages, uh, but also some drawbacks. One of them being damage to reactor walls over time from the sustained temperatures, like I mentioned earlier, but also the reactor walls can become radioactive eventually. But the hardest part of all is just the technical difficulty of maintaining 150 million degrees Celsius for extended periods of time. Now, using a pulsed approach, Helion hopes to not meet those same difficulties. Can you run me through like the energy recapture process? And how are you directly extracting the energy out to usable energy, say, at one point for the grid? Okay. So um, the approach we use, the fundamental physics, is the same that happens as in the alternator in your car, or even in the motor in an electric car in your Tesla, okay. where um, in these systems, uh, we put electrical energy into coils, magnetic coils, we'll see them today, large electrical uh, current flows on the order of hundreds of thousands to millions of amps of current that generates a magnetic field. And that magnetic field we use in a pulsed manner to compress our fusion fuel. Hmm. As soon as fusion starts to happen, it gets hotter. The pressure pushes back. And then by pushing back on that magnetic field, we can induce a current going the reverse direction, pull it back out. That's brilliant. Oh my gosh. Okay, that's actually really, really brilliant because then that's as fast as electricity itself, generally wasteless. It's as efficient as the electromagnet in the first place. Yep. You're just essentially reversing the process of compressing it, you're letting it compress back. This concept really blew me away, so I had to take a look at these coils. Look at that! <laughs> Fundamentally, the physics of fusion is really hard. We don't want to raise a single joule of energy. We want yeah. to take all of it in electricity, put it all in efficiently, and take everything out we can efficiently, so that we just have to do just that little bit of fusion. Think of it this way, their topography is the simplest example of the conservation of energy. So in any closed system, the energy leaving can't be greater than the energy coming in. An example, Tesla coils, all that high voltage coming out, it's always less energy than what the coil consumed in the first place. However, when a nuclear reaction takes place, mass is converted into energy. So with a generator like this, X amount of energy comes in from the coils, fuel mass undergoes fusion and turns into energy, and X plus fuel energy comes out through the coils. No moving parts to waste energy, all solid state, the coils provide and remove all energy. Speaking of fuel mass, most players in the market use a deuterium tritium mix. Now, deuterium is incredibly common. It's like one in 500 parts on this planet. In fact, this is a vial of deuterium water right here. Pretty cool. Now, tritium, on the other hand, uh, not so much. So, what does Helion use? I understand that a lot of the players in the market will use a standard DT mix. Yeah, so we actually named the company after the fuel. Um, so we use ah. deuterium helium-3, and uh, helium-3, the nucleus, is called a helion. And so, so that's actually what we named the company after. A helium-3, when deuterium and helium-3 fuse, it, it makes no neutrons. The primary reaction is all in charged particles. So that topology, you remove the middleman. You go straight from fusion reaction to energy out with no waste of spinning parts, turbines, energy loss, I mean, more or less energy loss from steam. Yep. It's, just a, it's a direct to process. Direct and efficient at the same time. Helium-3 requires some more specific uh, challenges and per unit volume produces a little bit less energy than a traditional DT fuel, but because it's so much more efficient, you end up winning overall. Okay. Apart from being efficient, the lack of neutron emission from a deuterium helion reaction helps to overcome one of the main obstacles of fusion in the first place. Hear me out. In a standard DT fusion, neutron emission tends to damage reactor walls over time. This seems to be a trend I'm talking about. Anyways, using helion, not so much. So this approach allows them to maximize generator lifespan and potentially minimize costs. To further minimize costs, Helion produces many of their parts in-house. This includes their high-voltage pulse capacitors, which they were happy to show off. This is the winding robot for a lot of the capacitors that Helion Energy makes in-house. And they call this the capacitor kitchen for a pretty obvious reason. Once wound, the film capacitors go into a machine which unifies and welds each layer, providing an electrical connection, which are then welded in parallel. These are huge! These are only a part of the capacitors they use. Then series, allowing for a voltage rating of tens of kilovolts. These are then placed into oil-filled containers, which make up the giant blue capacitor bank you see behind my head right here, ultimately providing over 50 megajoules of energy needed for the Polaris formation tests. Which is something Jobin here knows a thing or two about. 
As the project lead, he endured countless questions from me as I tried to understand how their machine worked. So on our full-fledged fusion devices, we use FRCs to make uh, fusion. So we form two of them with two of these on either side. Mm -hmm. and then we accelerate those FRCs together, and they merge, and we compress them to get our fusion conditions. So this is just for forming and studying FRCs, and then we can use that data and leverage it into future designs. So then you're going to be learning a lot from this test platform. How big will the final ones be uh, on the ends of the uh, They'll be generation. bigger than this. This is about a meter in diameter. Um, oh my they'll be gosh. bigger. Uh, what was the team effort like to get this underway? No um, doubt you guys had like a lot of struggles. So we were growing while we were building this, so there was a lot of struggles there. For my system, I, I did a lot of the vacuum work on this, and so inside oh. of this, we have about a billionth of an atmosphere. So you have to extract all that air out. Um, and to do that, you have to make sure there's no little leaks around. So even just a hair on one of the O-rings or anything will just make it not seal correctly. Um, and since it's such a large diameter tube, it was very challenging to get all that to seal. A billionth of an atmosphere. A billionth of 14.7 PSI. Yeah, it's like slightly lower than, than the, you know, fuser that I brought. <laughs> just like by a factor of about 500,000. <laughs> Jobin's team is essentially rapid prototyping an FRC plasma chamber from the ground up. It's remarkable because that's a ton of work. You know, continuous repair and improvement is inevitable for sufficiently advanced tech like this. So they're writing the blueprints as they go. And now it's in the test phase where I'm turning everything on and trying to fix it. Oh, I like how you put it that way, turning it on and trying to fix it, because yeah, you're doing the incremental testing, right? Yeah, it's an experiment, and so you don't, we haven't built this particular device before, we don't know how it's going to function, we always don't do everything correctly, and so just troubleshooting, trying to get everything working. There were a lot of IP-sensitive features which limited what I could capture on camera, but it was time for tests. With the walkthrough complete, they were roaring to push a couple of buttons because they were planning to form a plasma for further tests, and I had a front row seat. Their control room was under construction, so this was their temporary command center, complete with two official mascots. Nickel has one eye, Kabir likes to sit in boxes. <laughs> <laughs> While Jobin manned the controls, their chief scientist, Dr. George Vocherbeck, explained what they were expecting to see, a complete plasma formation lasting milliseconds with no instabilities. Jobin also explained that if things go well, we'd hear pretty much nothing. Uh, what if things don't go well? But in just a few short tense moments, I was about to find out. Ready to go? No loud noises, no bangs, and Jobin was happy, so I think the test was a success. I wasn't really sure what to expect, but as you just saw, it was nearly silent and lasted for just a fraction of a second. But that's exactly how their generators are supposed to work, in pulses. This current prototype is slated for six pulses per minute and is intended for a long cycling life. The Polaris formation is only a third of the finished generator, and it's a scaled down version as well. So their next steps will include building out the complete Polaris generator in their neighboring building right next door. As their seventh prototype, it'll be the latest in their line of fusion generators and a massive milestone for physics. And they have had other prototypes in the past that were milestones in their own right. So six current prototypes. Yeah. Uh, number three was the first one where uh, we compress a fusion plasma up to over 10 million degrees. We call that one IPA, okay. the inductive plasmoid accelerator. Um, and then number four was Grande. We switched over, Grande, we, we right. switched over to Starbucks. Grande, <laughs> which showed over 50 million degrees. Jeez. And then we had Venti and then Trenta. Uh, at some point we ran out of Starbucks, so we switched over to, to helium burning stars. That's 50 million degrees. It's almost as warm as my apartment. <laughs> Visiting their test facility was a phenomenal experience, and after speaking to at least a dozen team members, their passion is palpable, their ambition is contagious, and their plans might just change how we look at fusion. Helion, thank you for the epic tour, and for everybody watching, I'll leave a link down below so you can check them out further. David and I fundamentally believe in the unstoppable power of human innovation. Really, given enough time, there's nothing we can't do. And with that, thank you for watching, and you stay classy.